Hey, well, good, uh, good morning, everybody, and, and, uh, and thank you very much for, uh, for coming along. We've had, had obviously a slight um, change of plan in that we were expecting to hear this morning from Patrick Oroy, who is the NATO Assistant Secretary General for Defense Investment. Very unfortunately, um, he was uh, taken ill um, uh, yesterday um, afternoon and um, is therefore unable um, um, to be with us. And he's going to be represented instead by uh, Ludwig de Kom, who is the Director Strategy and Head of uh, the Smart Defense Support Team um, at NATO. Now, I don't think anybody here needs to be reminded of the fact that the pressure on NATO resources and the demand for NATO resources uh, is increasing, and at the same time, um, the resources to underpin those capabilities are shrinking as a result of economic pressures that are being felt on both sides um, of the Atlantic. So the question that NATO has increasingly to confront, um, has to confront with increasing urgency, is how does it gain more capabilities uh, from less in the way of resources? And that involves obviously a process of identifying the scope for sharing, uh, for pooling, for abolishing redundancy, for dealing with problems of duplication. And the response at NATO to this intellectual and policy and operational task has been the initiation of its smart uh, defense uh, initiative. And NATO is currently in the process of refining and honing um, ideas and proposals and suggestions for that uh, with the objective of presenting at least some preliminary conclusions or recommendations in time for the NATO Chicago uh, summit in, in May of, of, of this year. Um, now, at the ISS, we've um, certainly, as far as the European end of the equation is concerned, uh, been doing a bit of work on this subject over the last few years. Um, some of you may remember that in 2008, we published an ISS strategic dossier on European cap military capabilities, which took up many of these um, themes. And those of you who are members of the ISS, when you get your next uh, uh, a copy of Survival Through the Letterbox, you'll see that the authors of that strategic dossier Alex Nickel and Bastian Gigerich, uh, both from the ISS, have uh, done a kind of a follow-up extended um, essay looking at the question of getting value in European defense. And so um, we're very happy to be now conducting this discussion uh, in tandem with NATO and, and collaborating with NATO. And uh, we're very pleased that you've jumped in and uh, into the breach at last minute, uh, demonstrating that in that respect, at least, uh, NATO has the capacity to generate new capabilities <laughs> and deploy them rapidly <laughs> and at very short notice. Uh, uh, not into hostile theaters, I would say. Um, anyway, uh, thank you very much for being here. And you'll speak thank for about 20 minutes or so. And then we'll go into Q&A. Thank you. Uh, many, many thanks. And uh, great to be with he you here today, uh, coming this morning from uh, rainy Brussels to rainy London to share uh, some thoughts on uh, NATO uh, smart defense. Uh, I'm quite familiar with the subject in the sense that uh, I'm leading a, a civil military team at NATO headquarters that is uh, working on smart defense, uh, defining smart defense in cooperation with our Strategic Allied Command Transformation and with the Deputy Secretary General uh, Ambassador Vizoniero, who are the two special envoys for the Secretary General on smart defense. And so on the, on the daily basis, we are supporting them. And uh, as uh, was mentioned, we're now in the process of defining in more detail what we understand by uh, smart defense. Now, uh, the NATO summit, uh, which will uh, take place in May in Chicago, uh, bears sig uh, special significance for NATO. It will be an opportunity to demonstrate once again uh, allied solidarity and reaffirm nation's level, uh, NATO's level of uh, ambition recently stated in the strategic uh, concept. It's also a chance to assess the strength of the transatlantic link and NATO's commitment to maintain uh, peace and security. Along with Afghanistan, missile defense, cooperation with partners, a special place on the summit's agenda is reserved to capabilities and the Smart Defense Initiative. In my uh, introduction today, I will speak about NATO's plans to take forward smart defense in the run-up to Chicago and beyond. And I will argue the importance of building a solid smart defense platform for the future. 
As you may remember, the uh, idea of smart defense was introduced by the NATO Secretary General uh, at the Munich uh, Security Conference uh, last year. And the basic idea, which is to seek uh, in uh, a cost-effective and operationally effective manner solutions for capability development is of course not new. Uh, but in the context of the budgetary pressure, there is renewed necessi necessity to cooperate better so that we ensure that NATO capabilities are available to meet our objectives as expressed and assumed collectively at the highest level uh, at uh, the summit in, in 2010, uh, and especially through uh, the new uh, NATO strategic uh, concept. Now, the events that took place in 2011 uh, and in particular Libya, have underlined that we cannot uh, fully predict what lies over the horizon. At the same time, our economies are badly weakened uh, as the economic recession is affecting all allies. And there are strong indications that austerity will stay with us for a long time. While our armed forces are facing budgetary austerity, they have to cope with ongoing uh, crisis management operations and get prepared for future security challenges. And we see there increasing tension between financing current operations and, and investing in future capabilities. While we are confronted with today's challenges, we indeed need to ensure that we have the necessary long-term focus to deal with future challenges as well, not only when our economies are strong, but also in times of economic austerity. And as the world evolves, we need to be innovative to adapt to the rapidly changing environment. We must adjust our approach, change the way we do business, and we need, perhaps most importantly, to change our mindsets. Given the environment that we are working in, we think that smart defense is the only way forward. Now, <coughs> you tell me that is stating the obvious, what is actually smart defense. Now, smart defense is about nations building greater security, not with more resources, but with more collaboration and more coherence. The aim is to encourage nations to change their approach to capability development from a purely national one to one that favors multinational solutions. Now, let me explain you briefly where we are now and what is uh, what we intend to, to do in the next uh, few months. Uh, during the summer, a task force uh, led by our Allied Command Transformation uh, was put together uh, along with nations and identified about 200 promising areas where allies could develop and deliver bilaterally or multilaterally required capabilities. And these projects that were identified are in obviously in critical areas like uh, surveillance systems, uh, uh, systems uh, against uh, uh, IEDs, um, maritime surveillance, uh, drones, uh, and so on. But also less uh, expensive capabilities and already existing capabilities where we think by working together we can achieve economies of scale. Work is in progress to identify the optimum way to take these projects forward. And given the multitude of projects that we have, we are regrouping them, not just to make it better understandable for the audience, but also to seek coherence within different clusters of projects. And we have, for the time being, we have uh, <coughs> intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance is one cluster. We have a cluster on training. We have a cluster on sustainment and so on. During the meeting uh, of defense ministers in October, defense ministers welcomed the initiative and agreed to the importance of delivering a range of sub substantive multinational projects by the Chicago summit. For further work on the, uh, under the smart defense agenda, then uh, they appointed, uh, as I already mentioned, strategic light uh, transformation and the deputy secretary general to give them a mandate to engage on smart defense with political decision makers in capitals and to achieve strategic buy-in uh, from capitals at uh, senior political level. 
These bilateral consultations uh, are combined with a number of key uh, stock-taking and orientation events, uh, with uh, the meeting of defense ministers in, uh, in three weeks uh, being the most prominent one. Uh, and so this is what we are doing. We are consulting, consulting capitals, co consulting nations, uh, to see how we can uh, uh, better define uh, the way ahead. At the Chicago summit, we intend to present an ambitious but yet realistic package to bring about a, fo a refocus of how nations design, develop, operate, maintain, and even discard uh, capabilities. The Chicago summit is aimed at garnering critical mass and political buy-in to enhance prioritization, cooperation, and specialization as three key components of capability delivery within the alliance. And as I said, we are still shaping the smart defense agenda, and we intend to use every opportunity to socialize uh, our ideas with a broad range of experts, and the event today certainly will contribute to that. To stimulate a good discussion, uh, I would like to leave you with <coughs> a few observations and questions. The first one relates to the smart defense uh, concept. So smart defense can be seen as Europe's response to Secretary Gates' farewell speech uh, with the emphasis on Europeans taking more responsibility in the alliance and working together as an alliance to deliver better capabilities. This also means showing that the lessons learned from Libya are being taken into account. Smart defense can also be seen as NATO's response to the economic crisis with the emphasis on maintaining the right capabilities uh, in times of austerity. But while launched in times of austerity, we think that smart defense should be a long-term strategy that is not just limited to dealing with economic circumstances. Smart defense can also be seen as a new transatlantic engagement with the emphasis on a solid political agreement between Europe, the United States and Canada on how to cooperate more effectively on capability delivery. Second, about the three main imperatives of smart defense, which I already mentioned, prioritization, cooperation and specialization. Many of our nations have already bilateral and multilateral arrangements to allow for pooling of important capabilities. Some have engaged even in role sharing and specialization at, let's say, the more tactical level, but without being able to overcome strategic shortfalls. Given the reductions in most of our country's defense budgets, we are faced with an imperative need for coordination to create for more synergies and economies of scale. And here I would like to quote uh, the UK uh, Secretary of Defense, Mr. Hammond, uh, who, s who said at the conference, I think it was uh, two weeks ago, that the time has come to prioritize ruthlessly, specialize aggressively, and collaborate unsentimentally. Now on prioritization, it is clear that in an age of austerity, we have to carefully balance the feasible against the usable by eliminating expenditure on those requirements that are least important, allies and the alliance can create a headroom to fund most of our urgent requirements. We always tend to focus on additional equipment, additional <coughs> capabilities. We tend to forget what we already have in our inventories and make an assessment if we still need those capabilities. Nations, of course, have their own priorities, but all allies have agreed to the need of to tackle collectively current and emerging threats to converge with NATO and NATO's level of ambition. Now, thanks to the overall picture of allies' capabilities that it has, NATO, in my view, can work as a sort of architect for prioritization. This requires identifying those areas in which NATO allies need to keep investing. I would call that the must-haves. And I think we have many instruments already in place for such prioritization. We have the strategic concept, we have derived from that uh, political guidance, we have developed a Lisbon package of most pressing capability needs and so on. 
uh, on cooperation. Smart defense also means encouraging multinational cooperation. As the price of military equipment continues to rise, allies acting alone may struggle to afford high-tech weapon systems such as the ones used in Libya. Our view is that nations should work in small groups, possibly on a regional basis, to combine their resources and build capabilities that can benefit the alliance as a whole. Initiatives such as the Franco-British Treaty, the Nordic Defence Corporation, the Northern Group, cooperation in the Benelux uh, countries, the Visegrad Four, the Weimar Triangle, the Franco-German Corporation, have all created political momentum for multinational cooperation. We think we should build on that. NATO can act as a matchmaker, <coughs> bringing nations together to identify what they can do jointly and at a lower cost, more efficiently and with less risk. Doesn't mean that NATO has to run all these programs itself. <coughs> that is something we would ask nations to do. Multinational cooperation on many of the smaller projects that we are now considering, the whole list of 200 projects, which most of them are quite smaller projects, should lead to better value for money and economies of scale. But we must also consider more ambitious programs if we want to, to fill key capability gaps such as intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance. And here, perhaps the best option could be to build on programs that nations or groups of nations are already conducting or have planned uh, to conduct and to expand the scope and the participation of those uh, programs. This could mean, for instance, uh, making uh, radar systems on frigates uh, missile defense capable, as one nation intends to do. Such a program could be expanded to cover additional nations. Uh, expanding uh, participation in programs for satellite observation undertaken by one or more nations could also be a good template for further cooperation. And I would argue that expanding the participation in NATO's uh, ground surveillance program with new participants would also fall into this category. It is a fact that strategic enablers are beyond the reach of many individual allies. Now the question is how can we avoid key enabling capabilities such as strategic surveillance drones becoming too narrowly the province of one or very few allies? How can we better share the burden of expensive capabilities? Not only the costs of development and acquisition, but also life cycle costs, including operating it, of course. Our view is that we need to make multinational cooperation more mainstream, the rule rather than the exception. And I think the best way to do this is by embarking on concrete multinational projects rather than lingering on the theoretical debate. So actually learning by doing, I think, is here uh, very important. Specialization. Uh, another pillar of smart defense is specialization, which I think is the most sensitive one, as it addresses national sovereignty. I'm particularly looking uh, forward to hearing your views on this. Uh, under severe budgetary pressure, allies at times see themselves compelled to relinquish specific capabilities from their national inventories. For instance, maritime patrol aircraft uh, or capabilities for suppression of enemy air defense. These are two examples. The continuing disbandment of capabilities by individual allies has led to a sort of specialization by default on less expensive capabilities while creating shortfalls on the more demanding ones. Here I think NATO is uniquely suited to provide a framework for coordinated specialization. The idea is to invite nations to focus on specific strengths in specific capability areas as a step towards coordinated specialization within NATO's longer term defense planning. However, Specialization remains a sensitive subject since it raises concerns related to national sovereignty and at a time 
to solidarity and fair burden sharing and risk sharing. Often cooperation and sovereignty are seen, are seen as opposites. Inse instead, we should, they should be seen as a way to help us identify what are the areas where cooperation is most needed and what are the capabilities that need to be specifically maintain maintained at national level. It is a fact that today, too often, nations are cutting capabilities without coordinating with other allies. And the question is, are we willing to accept the implications of such an uncoordinated specialization by default on our common security? Instead, we should actively work together to turn specialization into specialization by design, where allies specialize on particular sets of capabilities through a process of consultation, accepting some degree of reliance on the alliance as a whole to, main, to maintain as full a spectrum as possible. Specialization by design can also identify redundancies in capabilities, the point I made uh, earlier, in a concerted way. It can help nations identify where they need to expand their investment in national capabilities and what are the areas of disinvestment. In NATO, we have set some initial steps on specialization through what we call the centers of excellence. Centers of excellence are hosted by a particular nation uh, and provide expertise and training support in a specific field like cyber defense, medical training, uh, mine warfare, uh, naval uh, mine warfare, uh, and so on. The next step in our view is to move from this type of specialization and training specialization to capability specialization. And a good example of that is uh, the CBRN niche capability of the Czech Republic, which was not only set up for national requirements, but also for NATO's requirements. Clearly, and I think this is an important point, all allies should maintain basic warfighting capabilities, such as infantry and combat engineers, and be prepared to share the risk <coughs> of actually using them in our operations. But we cannot expect all nations to cover the full spectrum of high-end capabilities, such as strategic air transport, combat helicopters, uh, fighter aircrafts, and so on. If we were able to agree on who does what in these increasingly expensive areas, then nations or groups of nations could sacrifice certain national capabilities with the understanding that this is not about savings, this is about reinvesting in their specific area of expertise. I think progress in this area will be really a reality check for indicating if we move forward on our smart defense agenda. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, the smart defense approach and the package uh, in general for the summit is still in the process of being defined. And as I mentioned, your contribution here today uh, will therefore be extremely uh, valuable. Uh, in, in particular, we would be interested in hearing your views on how should we develop the political and conceptual dimension of smart defense? What do you see as the keys to success? How should they shape the practical dimension of smart defense? What would be the main ingredients of such a practical dimension? And what can we learn from past experience? And how can industry help uh, in, in achieving our goals? In the end, it is clear that smart defense depends for its success on the wholehearted engagement of nations. Not only on decision makers and political decision makers and capitals, but also depends on the willingness and the proactiveness of program managers at a more technical level. While NATO can and will facilitate smart defense, allies are primarily responsible for making it happen. Smart defense is a refocus on how nations individually and NATO as a whole design, develop and deploy capabilities. Allies need to take stock of the experience in Afghanistan and Libya and build on it. We all want to see an alliance where all allies know that they can rely on each other, where all allies are also able to make 
meaningful contributions even in times of economic uh, austerity. I believe smart defense is the path we must take to achieve this and at the same time uh, we must build on the favorable momentum that we, see, uh, we have seen over the last uh, few months uh, on uh, the smart defense agenda which has become more and more a topic of discussion in capitals and conferences like this. I would like to thank you for your attention and I look forward to having uh, our discussion. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much indeed for that very um, clear um, uh, account of the principles underpinning the Smart Defence Initiative. Maybe I'll just kick off the 30 or so minute discussion period that, that we have by, by asking you to what extent thought has been given as to how this might work, how it might be operationalised. Um, has any thought been given to what kind of instruments, mechanisms, uh, NATO might need in order to gather to itself the authority to gain acceptance for the priorities that it sees and to lead this process of denationalizing defense policy across uh, the European continent um, in particular. It's obviously partly a matter of communication, but somehow the process needs to be, to be managed and driven. Imposed would be the wrong word. Um, but, but nonetheless, uh, from moving from premise to outcome, there's, there's clearly a, a process that needs to be, tr to be navigated. Is that something that um, at this stage you've thought about? Uh, thank you for that question. Yes, indeed, uh, th that is, uh, I think, key to uh, achieving uh, a successful uh, smart defense agenda. I think this should happen at two levels. One, we have the planning, the overall planning level, uh, which involves both political consultations, political guidance, and translation of that political guidance into clear priorities, and then a mechanism to allow nations to work on those priorities in very concrete terms uh, by taking forward specific goals, capability goals, in a concerted fashion. Now, what I'm describing here already exists basically we call that the NATO defense planning progress uh, process uh, which has been renewed uh, uh, three years ago uh, and actually builds on those specific steps so it is a mechanism that uh, allows political consultation derives from political guidance specific quite detailed capability goals that are then given to nations for implementation and then there is a feedback mechanism now, I think uh, the, the macro system is there. What mm -hmm. we need to do is to make the different steps in that system more, uh, more operational, so to say. At the same time, I think we, we have a, a huge, huge task to do at the program management level. Well, actually, uh, we can, of course, now say uh, multinational cooperation is the way to go. But it's also true that multinational programs do not always have a good track record. Mm. And so they're also improving multinational cooperation in those programs is also key. Uh, and there, th there is also work ongoing, in, uh, especially in the domain of the NATO agencies, which are currently in the process of being reformed to that effect. Thank you. Okay. Um, if anybody would like to make an intervention or ask a question, please catch my eye. Three people have done so already. A fourth. Uh, we'll, we'll plow on. First person to do so is Elizabeth Kennett, please. Just wait for the microphone to reach you. Elizabeth Kennett, um, how do you see smart defense fitting in with the new United States strategy with its emphasis on the Far East and also with its emphasis on, for instance, I Israel? What is NATO's relationship with Israel these days, and how do we fit in with the new U.S. strategy? Okay. We'll gather up, uh, uh, okay. I think, two or three questions. Um, Ian Brzezinski, please. Thank you, Ian Brzezinski, Atlantic Council. Ludwig, thanks for a great overview. I'm trying to put myself in your shoes in, uh, in May after the Secretary General rolls out smart defense. And I'm thinking what the press will ask, and I think one question they'll ask is, how is this different from the PCC? 
uh, and the previous defense capabilities initiatives. They all had their long lists. They all had mixed registered success. What's distinctive about this initiative and why is it going to be more successful than the past? And then gentlemen here in the, the front row, and then we'll come to Ludwig. Brian Burridge, former Air Force officer and NATO commander, six years an industrialist. I have a concern about NATO's credibility in all of this. On the one hand, there are some good examples of smart defense, which historically go back a fair way. The NATO AEW force, um, more recently the NATO strategic airlift force, um, NATO's air defense system itself was a matter of, uh, of collaboration, cooperation, and specialization. But if smart defense achieves the end state of getting nations to spend what resources they have on modernizing their forces and making them deployable, then that will have been a good thing. But I'm, I'm interested to know what you think will change, say, over 20 years, in terms of political will to get nations to accept the risk to go into offensive action with their pooled, shared, specialized, for example, advanced fighter aircraft. Because in Libya, with a UNSCR, which gave all necessary measures, even then, we couldn't drive to that happy state within NATO. Yeah, thank you for those uh, questions. Uh, first one on the, uh, on the US uh, strategy. Uh, I think there is a link with smart defense in the sense that um, there's, there's not a disconnect through the strategy uh, of the transatlantic link uh, that, is, that is very clear, that was also made very clear. But there is, I think, as part of the strategy, strategy the expectation that, uh, that the European side of, of the alliance will better work together and, and work on building uh, critical and key capabilities so that we, we, we still accept and, and actually work on a strategic, uh, our strategic goals as an alliance, but uh, as we have seen in Libya, uh, when, when Europeans wanted to take the lead in an operation, this could only be successfully done uh, uh, by relying on, on strategic neighbors from the United States. Now, I don't, I'm not suggesting here that this is a bad thing, but there is clearly an unbalance in the strategic enablers that we have in the alliance, and uh, uh, smart defense would try to help redress that balance. Now, as to your question in relation with uh, Israel, uh, this is mainly a political relationship that is being dealt with in the context of our partnerships with the Mediterranean Dialogue, uh, with some element uh, of uh, consultation and some element of cooperation, practical military, military cooperation, but quite limited, I must say. Uh, and that, that's where we are uh, in that relationship. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, yeah, uh, it, but it, it's, 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 a, it's a very difficult one because it also involves uh, uh, important uh, strands of work currently, as, as you will see, uh, for instance, the question was is, is often raised in the context of NATO's missile defense. How does that link and how does that relate to Israel? Um, the, the difference, what is different now? Why uh, perhaps would smart defense succeed better than the previous initiatives? Was well, I think that's the second question. You, you took uh, the track capability commitment as, a, uh, as an example. Um, I think by design, the initiative is different in the sense that we, yes, we are looking at cooperation on a list of practical issues, on a list of capabilities, but combined with that, we are also having an agenda for more uh, in-depth uh, change in the way we do business. So it's, it's a two-fold agenda. Uh, it, uh, there's a, a, a practical dimension to it, with all the projects that are currently being considered by the nations to do in small groups of nations, as kind of an icebreaker for, smart for uh, multinational cooperation. 
but there is also the intent to really work on, at the political level on some, a new set of guiding principles and I think specialization is a very specific one which was not present in the previous initiatives. Now will we succeed? That is another question. I think the conditions are also slightly different than in the past. Clearly the economic situation is different than when we had the prior capability commitment uh, um, initiative. At the same time, uh, I think there's also increasing awareness uh, and that is perhaps uh, linked again uh, to Libya that really there is absolutely a need for better cooperation uh, in the European context as well. Um, in, in terms of uh, cre credibility and making uh, the capabilities really deployable, and I think you gave indeed uh, some very good examples of uh, multinational cooperation and specialization in the past. Uh, NAUW obviously is still there, played a role, is playing a role in Afghanistan, is playing a role uh, in, has played a role in Libya. Um, we, we would like to take that model out also for the alliance ground surveillance, basically, of a group of nations uh, working together in an alliance context. Um, of, of course, the question is making, making the forces really deployable, because we have had situations where we had multinational entities in the logistics domain, uh, where groups of nations pull their efforts together, but then when it comes to actually deploy, deploy, deploying them, and then these uh, assets are no longer available. Uh, I, I think at the end of the day, nations will still have the, foreign, uh, the sovereign right to agree or not to agree uh, to deploy the capabilities. But as a matter of fact, what we see is that all our operations are multinational they all involve a, a, a multinational dimension. And, as, and we see that that multinationality happens uh, at, at a lower level than in the past. Uh, we see that uh, now uh, cooperation, multinational cooperation is happening for ground forces at level of company commander, platoon commander, which was not the case, uh, let's say, 20 years ago. So I think the way we design and operate capabilities should take that into account. And uh, my view is that we still too often design the capabilities from a purely national uh, perspective, whereas actually, if by design already built through a multinational uh, cooperation, then I, th I guess this would also facilitate uh, multinational deployment. We can take uh, positive examples on this. Uh, for instance, the F F-16 nations have had this long-standing cooperation, not only the acquisition, but also sustainment of the F-16 and training together, which allows them, which facilitates to deploy together. And this has been the case already for the Kosovo air campaign, has again been the case for the Libya campaign. So uh, I think uh, the, 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 the pro and cons of multinational cooperation, but since it is a fact that our operations are multinational. I think it makes a lot of sense to design the capabilities also from a multinational perspective. Thank you. We'll have uh, three more interventions in the next round, uh, beginning with Stephen Flanagan. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to comment, first of all, on one question uh, earlier raised about the strategy, the, U the new U.S. defense strategy and how it relates to NATO, and secondly, ask a question about the pooling and sharing safety mechanisms. Um, first of all, I just want to draw attention to, uh, well, the strategy does indeed talk about shifting the weight of, of effort in U.S. defense planning and strategy to Asia. It does reaffirm the commitments to uh, NATO's uh, st new strategic concept, and in particular, both the reaffirmation of working closely with allies and partners to maintain collective defense capabilities, but also the kind of flexible and adaptable posture in Europe uh, that will allow for uh, crisis response operations with allies and partners. Uh, both in and around Europe. So I think there is uh, not to be misinterpreted that this, this tilt to Asia is ignoring uh, NATO and indeed I think is very convergent with the NATO strategic concept articulated in Lisbon. Uh, Mr. DeKent, I wanted to ask you about some of the, uh, the gentleman's earlier question you just commented on talking about some of the successes in pooling and sharing strategic airlift, um, uh, the AWACS. Uh, we've seen instances where as a way to ensure access to those pooled and shared capabilities either through consortia or other 
common funding efforts that there's been sort of a national opt-out idea, the notion that to assure other allies that if they contribute to this effort, that those assets might still be available to them, even if not all allies are participating. And I wonder if that has been part of the discussion in Brussels of, of having some kind of mechanism for uh, an opt-out that would still allow uh, those willing to participate and to use those common assets or shared or pooled assets to uh, have access to them. Uh, thank you. Then the gentleman right at the end in the third row back. Yes, you in the red and blue tie. Uh, Henrik Breidenbach with the Center for Military Studies in Copenhagen. Um, I'm, uh, I'm wondering because the, the life of the alliance sort of has both a, a political and a military component and working on specialization runs the risk of formalizing different tiers of the alliance. I wonder how do you, what do you think about doing, how do you think about going about, how do you think about going about doing specialization without um, hurting the political component and the unity of the alliance in that sense? Thank you. Could you just pass the microphone to the gentleman in the last row there? Yeah. Uh, Paul Schultz, Carnegie Endowment and Kings. Uh, first, from a presentational point of view, is it really wise to call, to simply put the adjective smart in front of processes <laughs> anymore? We've had smart procurement over here, which was a disaster, and some, it, it begins to build up uh, a skepticism, doesn't it, if, if, if one hears that, that, that simple formula. More substantively, uh, specialization and Libya uh, surely poses more problems than you, you've suggested. If we were to become as, as truly cooperative, dependent on each other through specialization, then does that mean that NATO could not ever reckon on doing an internally contra controversial intervention again? Because key people, Germany, others, would simply possibly not go. A and you can certainly have political consultation now about all that, and that's splendid. But that doesn't give you much guarantee that in any particular future crisis, it, there's an assurance that everyone who might be indispensable will in fact be there. Final point, isn't there a, a problem in the background about uh, improvements in the most likely areas, which I guess are ISR, you've mentioned drones, armed and unarmed, and relations with Russia? Because those are exactly uh, the attractive, but rapidly deployable military uh, potentials which worry the Russians most, don't they? To reassure people in NATO by deployment and acquisition of those things is surely a recipe for in increasing anxiety and uh, typically Russian belligerence from the, the Putin and any future Russian regime. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, on the successes of uh, pulling and sharing and uh, the national opt-out uh, idea, uh, which I think is, is, is an Im important element, uh, is that we need to build in uh, some flexibility and also redundancy. Now, um, that's easier said than done. Uh, uh, redundancy in the sense that, uh, yes, you have a capability uh, composed by different nations, uh, the, the whole capability should not fall apart if one nation decides to opt out from, uh, from that capability, which politically may always happen. We know that even in a, in, in a perfect world solution. Um, so, but there, uh, again, if we, if we say redundancy, we say less efficiency. So we need to strike a balance there of what we think is, uh, is the best uh, trade-off between uh, uh, that flexibility and still remaining, uh, uh, still remaining efficient. But I think we need, we need to look at this really capability by capability. You could look at it, uh, uh, for instance, uh, NAUW, as, as was men mentioned, AVAC system, well is, is, is one example, uh, but we, we, we should look at uh, other examples as well. Then the question on, um, I think the, the two other questions were, were quite combined, was both about specialization and, and formalizing specialization and the inherent political risk of, of that. Um, and, and then also uh, the, the, the point in made in the question thereafter is depending on others. And, uh, and will that not make us more vulnerable than actually provide that added value? Uh, uh, the observation I would like to make here, I think specialization is, is happening whether we like it or not. And it's, it's happening, uh, that's what I call specialization by default. We see that o over, the, over many years, uh, nations have applied uh, kind of uh, salami slicing 
on their capabilities, reducing their capabilities either in terms of capacity or in terms of readiness. Uh, battalions with just one active company is, is one, one example. Uh, what we see now more and more as a, a trend due to the economic uh, situation is that nations are, rather than <laughs> horizontal cuts, are taking away full capabilities. Um, we can give some examples. Uh, for instance, a very concrete example, in, in the Benelux countries, the, none of those nations will have, in the future, will have main battle tanks. Now, okay, the, the question here is, is that a problem? Not necessarily. I'm not suggesting here that vertical deletions of capability is, is worse than horizontal. It may actually be better to cut a complete capability than just reducing all, all the rest of your capabilities. But the big point here is that if you, do do, if you don't do that in a coordinated fashion and in consultation with your allies, really then this process, I think, will continue. And you're going to end up with a very coherent inventory of capabilities. You will have, ha you will have far too many cheap capabilities and far too less uh, expensive ones. Now, the idea of specialization by design is that you do this, you try to, through political consultation and coordination, and this is very difficult, we realize that. You, you try to coordinate and guide national priorities on who is doing what, so that at least you keep a current capability within the alliance. Again, the, the issue will be of having some redundancy uh, of course, we don't see this as a big bang approach where suddenly all allies will say, okay, now I'm doing, uh, going to do air force, you're going to do uh, uh, land forces and so on. No, uh, I think, as I said, all allies should maintain a minimum level of combat forces that are deployable so that when there is an operation, all allies are still in a position to share the risk and contribute to the combat missions of the alliance. But it's specifically in niche capabilities and more strategic enablers that I think we should focus our, our attention. Um, and then, yes, of course, uh, uh, relations with Russia is always uh, a, difficult, uh, a difficult story. It is already difficult for a purely defensive system like missile defense, which is really a purely defensive system, more problems than actually the expeditionary forces we are building. So I, I think either I if we go defensive completely for defensive systems or other more expeditionary systems, I think those, uh, those concerns will remain, I'm afraid. Thank you. We, we have just about got less than 10 minutes left, and I've already got five more people on my list. So I'll try to take them all in terms of the, the questions. Can you all be as crisp and, and precise as you can? Uh, I'm told we do have to end this, uh, this meeting on time. Um, in the second row here, in the, in the turquoise uh, top. Hi, Patanzi from Rusi. Um, one thing I'm interested in is how, in terms of legitimacy and being able to influence governments and also the role that NATO now has, how do you see NATO fitting in with the structures of the European Union, um, which would also give you access to the commercial sector as well, and avoiding any duplication of effort, particularly in terms of European defence? Um, Thank you. And uh, here in the second row. Hello, Philip Strand from King's College War Studies Department. Um, today we've heard a lot of emphasis on multinational cooperation. And we know that historically some of the obstacles to cooperation include political costs associated with committing troops or financial costs associated with maintaining capabilities, even during peacetime when those aren't needed. And so my question is, to what extent are non-government assets being incorporated or considered into the Smart Defense Plan? And in specific, I'm referring to private military and security companies. So um, would you consider the U.S.'s operations in Iraq and Afghanistan as sufficient proof that the free market is flexible enough and capable of providing services to NATO operations in the form of life support, security, intelligence, and training? And can we, at this point, um, expect NATO to decrease or increase its reliance on private military and security service providers in the future. Thank you. Then here in, in the, uh, the front row, stick your hand up so the microphone people can reach you. Hi, 
Louisa Brooke Holland from House of Commons Research Service. Just want to ask, because um, we've talked about countries maybe not making the meaningful contributions that they have or expected to, um, is NATO considering introducing any penalties um, to put pressure, um, uh, to make sort of explicit pressure um, onto those countries? Um, thank you. And then, yes, here, just want to stand up. Thank you. William Weston, Royal Holloway University. Uh, in terms of uh, building and indeed maintaining capabilities, how much uh, of a threat do you perceive the common security and defense policy of the European Union to be to NATO's capabilities? Thank you. And then finally, Bastian uh, Gigli from, from the ISS in the front. Thank you very much. Uh, Ludwig, you, you talked a little bit about how this is about uh, changing uh, how, how, how governments provide and generate capability and changing from the national perspective to a more multinational perspective. And you said, um, you know, NATO already has the tools with the, uh, the, the defense pl uh, uh, planning um, process. I mean, if we look at the, the history of that, it's not been very good at penetrating national planning assumptions. So um, I guess the question is, does it have to be fixed or changed, or does NATO, ac NATO actually need something else alongside that to, uh, to affect that change that you've, been, that you've been talking about? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, if, if I could uh, perhaps combine the, the first and the fourth uh, question, which are both about uh, Europe. Uh, clearly, uh, cooperation with uh, European Union is, is, is very important. Uh, we all know that uh, actually we are talking about nations, not so much about organizations, and it is it are the nations who bring forward the capabilities that we need. So whether those capabilities are now developed through the European Union or through NATO is not that important. It's important that uh, they, are, they are made available. Um, in terms of uh, smart defense, uh, we, we really uh, welcome uh, 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 the pooling and sharing initiative from the European Union as well. And at a practical level, we are working very closely. And you know there is a, a political framework within which we have to do that uh, through staff to staff uh, coordination on projects. So that basically when nations are signing up for projects on both in both organizations that the staff come together and say are we not duplicating each other uh, are we not just creating uh, uh, problems here uh, by uh, having two separate programs so and then we make nations aware come together try to keep the conflict and so on. that is at a practical level however there's also more at let's say the, uh, the political uh, level for instance, initiatives by the European Commission on, uh, on, the, uh, on the European defence markets, which is obviously an area on which NATO has almost no leverage, that is that we very much welcome because we, we do see the problem of a fragmented European defence markets uh, and if that can be alleviated or fixed through such initiatives, that is something uh, uh, for sure that, that we would welcome. Uh, and, 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 and in that context, we, uh, through the Smart Defence Initiative and on the European side, pooling and sharing initiative, uh, we actually we, we serve the same purpose of making, of building the capabilities that we need to fulfil the political ambition of both organisations, EU and, and NATO. So, but there is a clearly a political dimension to it, but also a very practical one on which we on which we are working. The question about uh, non-governmental assets and uh, PMCs and so on, um, uh, is that been taken into account? Not yet as part of our, let's say, uh, conceptual approach, but in the practical terms, I must say that I mentioned those uh, 200 projects uh, that have been identified by Allied Command Transformation. In those, there are a number of uh, projects that rely on on, on, on the free market, so to say. For instance, uh, there is a project uh, for uh, helicopter services relying on, on, on contractors. There is a project for uh, UAV services relying on contractors. So then again, the question is, are nations willing to sign up for that? And what is the approach 
of nations towards such a capability. In some cases, they will see it as an element of flexibility, that they just rely on it when needed. There's also risk involved in that, as we know, because you're never sure that that asset will be available. But in some, some areas, they may also see it as a gap filler. Uh, for instance, in the UAV domain, where they would be building a national capability, but in the meantime, rely, rely on, on contractors to, to have that capability available. Um, interesting question on penalties. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, I think we, uh, since we, we, uh, our decision making is based on consensus, we, we would need consensus to have penalties. Uh, <laughs> and that uh, you know, <laughs> might well be uh, difficult, uh, difficult to achieve. Um, the there is, uh, now that I mentioned this, in, in, in the consultation process at NATO on, on defense planning, all decisions are taken by consensus except one, and it's an interesting example, it's perhaps not used to, to its full extent, that is uh, when an assessment is done <coughs> on a, nation, a nation's defense efforts in, in the context of the, national, uh, uh, of the NATO defense planning process, then that report is submitted to for, for formal approval to all nations except uh, the nation concerned in, in that report. But again, that is just, uh, just one, one example but no, uh, penalties, I don't know, and th there are some national representatives in the, in, the, in, the, in the audience as well. It would be interesting to see what their views are to this. Um, and then uh, the, if I'm not mistaken, the last question which came from uh, Bastian about the NATO tools. I, I do believe we have, uh, th that at a macro level, let's say, we have everything that we need. We have, a, a, a all we need to define the political ambition of the alliance. We have then uh, a mechanism to translate that political ambition into real capability requirements. We have a mechanism to allocate those requirements to nations, then to work on, on those capabilities. We have now a, uh, an additional step in facilitating nations to achieve those capabilities. Th that step, in my view, should still be much more developed as it is today. And then we have a feedback mechanism looking at nations, what have nations achieved over the last years and feed that back into <coughs> the political decision making. So I think that macro system, macro process is there. But I think we need, and true smart defense, I think we need to focus on th the mechanisms in those different steps and make those, uh, optimize those. And especially, I think, in the area of uh, facilitate the implementation of capabilities. I think that's still a huge area where we can uh, have room for, for improvement, I would say. Thank you very much indeed for that. We'll follow this very closely in the next months and of course particularly the Chicago uh, summit. Thank you very much again for stepping into the breach. Please send our best uh, wishes to Patrick Roy. Oh, I do so. And um, we hope to continue this discussion after Chicago. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you.